Warning, the following Otaku Generation podcast has content of an adult and mature nature and is not necessarily safe for work or appropriate for children under the age of 18. If you are easily offended by content of this type, please stop this recording. Parental discretion is advised. The opinions and viewpoints expressed on Otaku Generation are those of the cast and crew and the individuals that express them and are not necessarily associated with the sponsors or guests of the show. Otaku Generation is a Red Apple production which is solely responsible for its content. All impressions are poorly impersonated. And please, for the love of God, don't try this at home. Hi there, this is Vic Mignogna, anime voice actor for shows like Edward Elric and Full Metal Alchemist, Dark Mouse, ED and Angel, Broly and Dragon Ball Z, and lots of others. And guess where you are? You're listening to the one and only Otaku Generation. What's Reesh? What's bank? Well, you know who to thank. It's Ellen and the boys. So let's all make some noise. The acting never gets old. It rocks me to my dumb hole. They bring all the otaku to the yard. Otaku generation, they rock hard. Otaku generation show. 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 Otaku generation Welcome to the show triple seven. We we have Ooh. we got the seven hundred and seventy seven. Uh, jackpot, baby! Jackpot. <laughs> that's right. You won the jackpot of anime podcast. Um, so hi, hello everyone. I am Alan. I am Matt. I'm Bryce, and I am Paul. Indeed, we are full cast today. Um, so wow, it's been so weird. We've we've been talking about. Uh, uh, other shows for so long we haven't done what's freesh in a while what's freesh what's bang what's squeak with the yoji crew um if you asked me a month ago i had lots of things that i did in life and then uh i bought animal crossing and then uh <laughs> then it all kind of stopped <laughs> <laughs> it all kind of stopped uh, i've been sort of grinding on it here or there every day uh, a couple times a day go in come out um i am not driving my life by it meaning it is not motivating me to get up at 8 a.m on a saturday to see what mornings look like on the island i am not doing that um <laughs> i'm not that bad yet but uh but nevertheless i i have been playing that a lot um i have I have watched a bunch of movies. I, for life of me, cannot recall them anymore. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, I watched through... So so Simon had recommended a TV show on Netflix called um, Kim's Convenience Store. And uh, it's basically just a family, Korean family, who runs a convenience store. And uh, it, it happens, actually, the, uh, the store is in Toronto. Which is, you know, special for for Simon because he lives there, um, and so uh, it's it's a fun sort of you know sitcom, I guess, a little bit, um, and I like it. And so I watched through season four, and then last night I started watching uh, season two of Altered Carbon, and I I don't know, I, I think there's better sci-fi, and I think this is one of those cases where they they want to uh, they want you to feel to squirm a little bit, and uh, I don't like shows like that that intentionally do stuff like that just to make you squirm just to be violent for violence sake you know okay. so, so, why are you squirming okay now yeah I and, and that's <laughs> <It's violent. laughs> just like oh, oh okay i didn't this just didn't need to see that um but you know i vested in the first season of it so i've I, i'll probably continue watching though when i get to those moments where i'm just like okay i know you're going to milk this for like 15 minutes so i'm just going to skip right past it um, and so I have that advantage with things like Netflix. Um, outside of that, I can't remember the movies that I watch, so I'm just going to move on. Matt, what about you? Uh, anything hot and exciting for you? Well, let's see. Um, well, basically, I've just been sort of trying to deal with, uh, with the pandemic quarantine and the sort of attendant changes that that brings. I find that I'm sleeping a lot more than I usually do, and since I have health problems, I, I already sleep a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's, uh, that's kind of a problem. So I've mostly been spending my time, you know, trying to, uh, feed myself from supplies inside the house. 
But the one geeky thing I have been doing is I've been continuing my rewatch of the new Doctor Who um, backwards. Uh, and now I'm finally back down to season two, the first season with David Tennant showing up. Hmm. And i uh, been having a lot of fun. There's a lot of classic episodes in uh, early David Tennant and uh, looking forward to rewatching them. Yeah, I think David Tennant and Matt Smith are the ones that I like the most. Um, I didn't wasn't really in the Peter Capaldi's character, and I have not watched the I guess the latest reincarnation of the Doctor. Um, mm -hmm. I just sort of fell off paying any attention to Doctor Who at all. So um, Christopher Eccleston, I guess mm -hmm. Doctor Number One in the sequence of the reboot. Um, yeah. you know he wasn't bad. I liked him in general. Uh, it took me a while to get used to David Tennant, but I think some of the best episodes <laughs> happen with Tennant. Um, mm -hmm. I think I kind of like his sort of spunk a little more comparatively to the other Doctors. Um, and then I don't know enough classic. I only saw classic when I was like super young. I saw Tom Baker. Mm -hmm. That was it. That was what was on oh, our yeah. local. Tom Baker. Local... You ask people in the U.S. who their favorite yeah. Doctor is, and it's like Tom Baker. Well, he was basically Doctor when the series got brought over here. Uh, yeah, and I saw it on PBS, basically, mm -hmm. when I saw it, if I saw it at all. Um, yeah. So that's it. That's my that's my take on it. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's interesting. Are you going to go deep dive into the classics? <laughs> uh, well, I have a lot of uh, the Tom Baker individual episodes, so I'll have to see how I feel after I get done with Eccleston. Um I may need to uh, to buy some some of the newer seasons. Do you know if uh, any of the Jodie Whittaker stuff is available on home video yet? I don't know. I am far from the expert. Jefferson is the expert. <laughs> mm, I'll have to research that. Yeah, you should reach out to him. Um, so let's see. What else have I been doing? Uh, uh, mostly trying to put myself to sleep with uh, Facebook on the... Uh, on the iPad, but it doesn't really work because it, it sort of like triggers your light reflex to make you think it's still daylight outside, which makes it harder to get to sleep. Oh yeah. So. It inhibits like the melatonin uh, production, I believe. That's what I've heard. <laughs> um, I, you know, that what the mechanism is? I'll believe it. Yeah. So one of the <laughs> advantages right. <laughs> uh, for the color light bulbs in the house, at least in the living room is when I'm on work, I put them in, sort of a blue-white mode, a concentration mode. And then mm -hmm. when um, when I am simply just, you know, off work or weekends, whatever it is, I put it in a, a, a daylight mode. So it makes it much easier for me to sort of just turn off. Um, mm -hmm. So it's surprising how the sort of the, the tone of the temperature of the light that's in your environment uh, will keep you awake and, um, you know, operating. Very interesting. Yeah. Um, so that's about it for me. Um, how about, uh, how about you, Bryce? You got anything cool happening lately? Um, so, uh, I've been listening to, so I found this band on Spotify, which I'm really sweet on right now called Satellite Young. And they are a synth pop, uh, Japanese band that is heavily influenced by the sound of 1980s J-pop. Mm -hmm. And I really love it. <laughs> like every one of their songs you can see is like an ending or an opening to an 80s anime. And it's <laughs> it's pretty great. So uh, I would check them out. I, they're available on Spotify. I don't know if they're available on other streaming services. But yeah, it's Satellite Young. I just want to throw that out there right now. I am very liking it. <laughs> um, oh, this is anime wise. I want to more Vinland Saga. I want to make that a topic in the coming future. So I'm going to finish that first uh, 24 episodes up. It's on Amazon Prime. Uh, it's still good. You know, it's a you know, it's a gritty, you know, Viking war drama. And I think it it delivers on that very well. <laughs> it's you know, it's what it says it's going to be. Mm -hmm. So uh, we'll definitely do this a topic uh, in the future for sure. Once I finish it up, um, I think it's like 24 episodes available in the anime. I don't know if it got greenlit for more. I mean, the manga is still going. And I know like a lot of people love the manga. Even people who I know who aren't super into manga seem to like Fiddlin' Saka. Something about it. Well, who doesn't uh, like Vikings? It, yeah, you're right. <laughs> and also, it's very cool. Uh, yeah, it's a very dramatic uh, series, but also it can be kind of funny at times too. I think it, I think it does a good job of sort of balancing that stuff. But like no mistake, you made it's a pretty violent series. It is a Viking War series, and brutal stuff happens. Mm -hmm. 
Um, on the manga front, I've been reading more Fire Force. My opinions of that are still pretty positive. I think it's a, uh, it's pretty good. <laughs> there's a, there's this weird like side arc where apparently, so this this story is about these this fire these squads of firefighters who fight fire demons basically and. <laughs> I guess oh, yeah. every year there's like an annual like contest between the uh, the fire uh, squads where the male members want to try to get the best, most votes for the male, you know, posing uh, uh, calendar shoot. <laughs> so every month features one of these squads. And there's, there's a whole like side like joke story about how, you know, uh, Squad 8, which is what the main, the focus of the, the whole series is on, is like trying to, you know, you know, be muscly bound and get out there and pose and like, you know, make sure they have the best, uh, you know, they get the best um, votes as far as the best squad, as far as male muscly members posing. And mm -hmm. They show all the other squads and it's pretty funny. It's, 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 it's good. <laughs> it's a good, uh, good little side. Cause it, right before this, it was a very dramatic arc that ended and it's like, they needed to lighten things up a bit. So I'm glad it happened uh, about 11 volumes in. There's I have I have a, I have 15 volumes owned. I because like a humble bundle did a whole humble like 15 volumes of it for I don't know like three dollars or something whatever I paid. So I might keep going past that. I know it's like there's over 20 volumes available, so I might keep reading past that. Uh, but I'll see when I get to volume 15. It's it's good. Uh, you know it's funny because I'm almost done the my rewatch of the entire Soul Eater anime, and in some ways I like Soul Eater a little bit more because it's a little more creative in the way it's presented and the um the imagery it does. You know, Soul uh -huh. is very like like really crazy in a lot of, in a way that Fire Force feels a little more traditional in a shonen sense. Mm. Which is fine. I mean I love traditional shonen series, but something about Soul Eater just does something different. It just has that style that I think doesn't uh -huh. quite come through with Fire Force. Um Okay. The thing about Soul Eater, though, is that it diverts from the manga pretty heavily, I feel like, um, from sort of the last arc, because they had it in the anime, but the manga was still ongoing. But I will say this, the diversion material from Soul Eater is way better than anything like the, that the FMA did, Fullmetal Alchemist did, with their <laughs> original series. Like, there's there's some heart to this, <laughs> to this ending, and I'm one episode away from finishing it up, so we'll see how it fully ends. But so far, I've been pretty entertained by it. I will definitely continue to read the manga though once I um, finish with the anime. I'll probably uh, I forget I, I I read a guide to say like hey this is where you should where you should start once you finish the anime to see where it diverts and go from there. So that's probably what I'll do. Um, other manga stuff: Hachimaru Samurai Eight. This is the uh, the uh, samurai series by written by the author of Naruto. Uh, mm -hmm. ar the artist is one of his longtime assistants throughout Naruto. Uh, it got canceled. <laughs> apparently a month ago oh. or something i didn't realize it and i'm pretty surprised i thought i didn't love what i was reading of it but i thought maybe his clout would maybe keep it going for a little longer but i guess yeah it's just one of the things i realized is, as as shonen jump's been available here weekly you know through the biz uh you know the biz subscription service these series get canceled real quick if, they, if they're not super popular so it's hard to get like super invested in them once they when, when they first start you kind of have to wait till they make it to like chapter 40 or 50 mm. then you know they're probably gonna stay around for a while but yeah if even like you know the author of naruto can't keep a series going it's kind of kind of wild it's a pretty uh mm. pretty tough uh tough market i guess but yeah i mean it's it's not just enough to be you know a, a talented mangaka you've got to find that one title that setting those characters that plot that all clicks together with the zeitgeist of the day and can fires people imagination yeah and it's i guess it's very competitive to be in jump i mean it's the most mm. you know circulated magazine so i imagine that you know if you're not if you don't have a hit you don't have like a blockbuster right out the gate maybe it's tough to stick around oh yeah um if if you get like the japanese editions of manga they have like those little viewer response cards oh, or reader yeah. response cards mm -hmm. and titles live and die according to what the reader response cards come in with like, if yeah, you like it, that's that keeps going. And if not, a lot of people say they love it. You're out, <laughs> which is funny because I wonder, like, because now that you can sort of read these series week to week, even in America, I wonder, like, do they care at all? Like what the Western response is? I guess not, <laughs> I guess yeah. would be. But it is interesting that like nowadays it's like, yo, I can read these series the week they debut in Shonen Jump by, you know, a couple days, probably at most uh, to get them translated over here officially and legally. Um, but yeah, 
it's crazy. But yeah, I don't know. Mm-hmm. I didn't love Hachimaru so much. I'm not crying over it. But I'm just saying mm-hmm. it was just an interesting like cancellation because it was sort of a big name behind it. I figured mm-hmm. it might have stuck around, but not the case. Uh, on the game front, I've been playing the Final Fantasy VII remake. Um, oh I'm not yeah, Animal Crossing. Yeah, uh, it's on very which good. platform? On uh, on Switch. What Animal Crossing or? No, no, no. Uh, Final Fantasy. It's only available on PS4 right now. Oh, PS4. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, the re- the remake is. I think you can play the original on Switch. Actually, they released that one. Um, it's it's very good. It looks gorgeous. I have to say, <laughs> um, just like seeing Midgar sort of rendered in this beautiful HD. You know, it hmm. it it just looks awesome. As somebody who you know played the old PlayStation One Final Fantasies, like this is like you know mind blowing in a lot of ways. Just to sort of see like how much more you know engaging be with the world mm-hmm. um, i'm it's weird because i'm not the biggest final fantasy 7 guy i was always one of those weirdos who loved final fantasy 8 because <laughs> it was my first final fantasy like true final fantasy i played through uh just because i got a playstation that was the latest final fantasy that had come out so i played that one first i mean i liked 7 but i only played through once so i don't remember a lot about it so mm-hmm. it's kind of fun to play through this i don't really i mean i know it's sort of the big story beats but it's all kind of sort of surprising what's happening. I don't remember, you know, the details, uh, but I like it. You know, it's it's an action RPG more so than it used to be. It's weird because they have this thing called a classic mode, they call it, which I think if you're going to remake something and have a mode called classic mode, mm. it needs to really, really, really evoke the original. It doesn't. <laughs> it's like this. Basically, it's kind of like an easy mode where like the time doesn't pass as quickly when you're making decisions to attack. So it's really uh, the regular mode is the way to go. And I like it a lot. It's, you know, it's very more action based. It's it, this might sound like a bad thing, but it kind of evokes Kingdom Hearts combat in a lot of ways, but way less mashy and way more like skill based. <laughs> you know, I love Kingdom Hearts, but that's a press square as much as you can until you have a triangle prompt. Then you press that. Uh, this was a little more. Um, if you, if you do that, you probably lose because it's actually a pretty it's actually so far a fairly um challenging game, but not impossible. Uh, and the music's great, too. I mean, they remade, they remade the music, which, hey, the music of Final Fantasy is probably the best thing about Final Fantasy throughout the years. No question <laughs> is the music. Um, but yeah, uh, Paul, do you play Final Fantasies? I can't remember. No, nope, uh, I have never managed to get into them. Yeah. I, I gave one a try many, many, many years ago and just uh, never clicked. OK, that's fair. That's fair. Uh, this comes to PC, which I believe it is scheduled to come to PC at some point. I know it's PS4 only right now. You mm-hmm. might uh, find you might like it, I think. Um, I play has a Japanese voice track because I've heard a lot of people complain like, oh, the dialogue sounds so stupid. I'm like, well, it's because you're not playing on Japanese. <laughs> so when they say <laughs> things that sound stupid, it sounds a lot less stupid when it's Japanese because you don't really understand what they're saying. Yeah, there and it definitely sometimes... helps. There's yeah. there's an inherent poetry in language that, that yeah. never really translates into another language. Yeah. And Cloud's sort of like aloof, whiny attitude is way, way more tolerable <laughs> in Japanese, I'm sure. So I haven't tried English, but I'm just going to assume that's the case. <laughs> Uh, but it's good. Uh, I will continue to play through it for sure. Um, it's it's a challenging game, though. I just say that. I, there is an easy mode, so you can probably choose a lower difficulty. That's fine. Um, but I'm just going to play in the normal mode for now and see how it goes. And then the last thing is um, the Mag- Magic Arena uh, released the newest Magic expansion, Ikoria, Layers of Behemoths. And, you know, <laughs> these days, a good digital version of Magic is welcome more than ever because nobody's going to comic book shops to play magic on Friday nights anymore. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's cool that the magic arena exists uh, because yeah, it's a really cool set. It's the whole mechanic is that this thing called mutate. We're sort of, you, if you have a creature on the board and if you're not a magic fan, you might know what I'm talking about, but Hey, magic fans, if you have a creature on the board, you play a creature mutate. You can sort of like mute, like combine it with a creature already. You've already cast. And then you sort of get ability. Then their abilities sort of combine, and they become sort of a better creature, almost a little Yu-Gi-Oh like, I guess, in a lot of ways. But um, I really like it. It's it's fun. Uh, Magic Arena, I think, is a really good product. Uh, it has I have some sort of issues with it, but as far as like as a free-to-play card game, I think it it's fair and it doesn't like require you to spend any money really to get a good deck. You just have to sort of put some time into it. Mm-hmm. And you know, just play on rank. That would be my. If you want to get started out, you don't know like really how to play, make a good deck in Magic competitively. Just uh, they give you a lot of starter decks that are very, I think, competitive. Just don't play ranked. Play unranked, and you'll probably get a good experience. A lot of people are sort of just trying out new decks and who are newer to the game. And I feel like nowadays there'll be a lot more people who are new to the game because they can't play their Friday Night Magic 
uh, every week, you know, at the local comic book store. So it's also doing a kind of cool thing where, like, I guess if um, Wizards, I guess, of the Coast is pairing up or teaming up with some comic book places where you can sort of, like, play for rewards in Magic Arena right now that when we can finally go, when the quarantine, I guess, is sort of over, we can go sort of, you will get rewards, like physical rewards, when you sort of show them, like, hey, I played, you know, these Friday Night Magic events. And you'll get sort of like promo cards and stuff like that. So it's kind of cool. It, oh, it will, okay. it will it, yeah, it will incentivize you to go back out once uh, this is all over. So yeah, um, that's cool. That's a cool thing to do. Uh, I guess about it for me. You know, it's Magic, okay. Animal Crossing, and some other game. That's some of the game had to be Final Fantasy this week. <laughs> <That's Yeah. it. laughs> I saw some of it because I I occasionally will pop into Twitch, and there is one particular um, person I follow. And she was playing Final Fantasy, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and I was like, oh, okay. So they put out another one. <laughs> and it looks This is a remake good. of one of the popular ones. But... Yeah, she was, she was, I don't know what she was doing. She was slinking behind some stuff through an alley to find a bunch of people talking in front of the things she wanted. But the graphics look pretty interesting because there were shadows and lights and stuff like that all over yeah. the place. And it seemed to be more than the usual, like, Final Fantasy, you know, game. Yeah, yeah I think it's, it's, a, it's a huge upgrade over a PS1 game, no question, <laughs> for sure. But, yeah, they, yeah. they went all out with the, with the technical aspects of it. Mm -hmm. All right, Paul, what about you? What about me? Uh, what have I been watching? Uh, I, I've been watching a couple things. Um I haven't really uh, dipped back into any of the new shows. I did watch a couple more episodes of uh, my next life as a villainous. Uh, that looks like it's pretty promising. Okay, cool. Uh, so, yeah, so definitely uh, optimistic about that one. I did check out a couple more episodes of The Eighth Son, Are You Kidding? And after episode one, it went uh, straight up uh, bog standard isekai. Okay. It looked like it might be a little more uh, like a sentence of a bookworm uh, where you've got, you know, like somebody who's like taking advantage of their outworld knowledge, but no, he's just like a super overpowered magic user. So there is no challenge in his life at all because all falls before him. So uh, I think I stopped halfway through episode three because I was so bored. Mm. The villainous anime looked cool. Like I think it's a cool concept for an isekai style show for sure. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That that was fun. Uh, is there anything else that I'm trying to think? I probably watched a couple other things. I was watching some old '80s action movies that did not make me happy. Um, <laughs> just uh, not living up to the uh, to the memories. I gotta say. And uh, what else? Uh, so let's talk about Animal Crossing. No, we're not actually going to talk about <laughs> Animal Crossing because Alan Price and I talked for about Animal Crossing for like an hour and 15 minutes yesterday yeah. for the after the show. Yeah. And uh, I need to release that. So I'll, I'll probably edit that tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, maybe. We'll but, see. We'll see if Animal Crossing doesn't get me first. You, how can you avoid the majestic, sensual lure of the mystery that is Tom Nook? Yeah. <laughs> Um, also on the gaming front, I guess I will mention Borderlands 3. My brother and I have been playing about twice a week, I'd say. We'll uh, uh, connect up online, you know, hook up voice chat, play for a couple of hours. Uh, we're getting to the point where we're starting to get some decent guns because Borderlands 3 is all about the guns and the enemies exploding into pinatas of loot. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've got to say... I'm really, um, I mean, it's it's a perfectly fine way to spend some time, but it's not a great game. I can see that, yeah. Um, I, I mean, I, I'm really wishing, I mean, it's all, it, at, fundamentally, it ends up being just about DPS. You know, how, how fast is the gun you're wielding dealing out damage and, you know, how, um, you know, dynamic is the various... Uh, uh, sort of, you know, is it shooting out missiles? Is it, you know, causing explosions of uh, of corrosion? Is it, you know, inflicting radiation on the enemy? And, you know, they've done a great job with variety, but it just doesn't feel tactical at all. Yeah. I mean, you know, for my shooters, I really want, you know, like, headshots to mean something. I mean, fundamentally, I, I, I 
just love stealth games, you know, something where you can do it methodically and it feels like, you know, your interaction with the game is based on something you're doing. Whereas with this, you know, you're just spraying. It's like, oh, no, I have bad guns in my inventory. And, you know, so you go down, you know, your your your, your friend resurrects you and you keep on going. And if your DPS was high enough, you managed to triumph. Uh, but but really, uh, you know, that's what Borderlands is about. And that's been yeah. fun for a lot of times. And if the guns are fun enough, that works. Uh, but the, the it's just not quite gelling. And part of it is that, you know, so, I mean, we're like four games into this franchise now, counting the pre-sequel. And they really should have cottoned on to the fact that this game is all about testing out and comparing different guns and like the the mechanics of managing your inventory and comparing guns against each other is actually worse it's gotten worse with every game i mean you know borderlands one was better than borderlands two and this is just totally worse than borderlands three so the game crawls to a stop as you try to you know sort through these uh you know the the, the very high level descriptions of the guns you have uh, at, at the moment i can wield three at, at most you can wield four but you know the, the whole thing is you want to be able to just enjoy this bounty of guns and they make it so hard to do that and i just don't get um why they are so misaligned with the the rewards that this game clearly wants to give you. Mm. That sounds pretty damning for a loot based game. I gotta love I gotta love what yeah. you <laughs> yeah. probably compare loot. I feel like why we play in this game. <laughs> but yeah. So, so maybe I haven't hit that uh, sort of Stockholm syndrome point. I, I I'm about I guess I just hit level thirteen today. Uh so you know, about level twenty five, thirty, somewhere in there. We'll see if it actually that the rhythm starts to click in. Um as I said, it's a you know it's a fine way to spend some time, you know, do some voice chat with my brother, see how he's yeah. doing. Um, uh, but I'm kind of wishing that, you know, there was just a little more game to this game. Mm. So, all right, that's it for me. Okay. I'm not running out to get Borderlands 3. I, I, I like Borderlands 1 and 2 quite a lot, but... Yeah, you, know. you know, a couple of times I've like I, I, I'm pretty close to suggesting to my brother that we go back and play Borderlands one or two just because uh, the the feel of those mechanics is solid. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you press the button, you feel like there's a direct connection between what's happening. And there's just, you know, so much uh, so many layers of we're going to make this gun fancy and we're going to make it hard for you to wield this gun that it just, you know, you can't you can't get into a groove. Mm. Mm. As far as PC, uh, I, if I may, I haven't asked you about this, Paul, yet, but the first person shooters on PC, have you thought about getting Black Mesa? Because I bought a copy, I haven't started playing it yet. This is the fan Valve blessed remake of the original Half Life. <laughs> Ah, yeah. So actually, I have uh, Black Mesa, and okay, I have he's... played almost all of the way through it. Okay, how is it? So, so, <laughs> so many, many years ago, I picked up Black Mesa. I actually, I, I downloaded it, um, I, I have no idea how many years ago at this point, back before it was on Steam, and registered it with the Steam client. And I think I played up through, there's a point where you have to get by a helicopter on a bridge that is just mm -hmm. brutal. Mm -hmm. And so I stalled out there. Um, uh, but I but when so so recently uh, it you know has I, I did it actually hit the one oh release it did yes that's why okay. that's why I got it because I, I saw yeah. that I was like okay yeah, yeah so I'd been holding off until they actually got Zen out in something close to its final form uh, so if you aren't familiar with Half Life lore Zen was the final uh, level or area of Half Life uh, after this you know incredibly long crawl through this research facility facility in the American Southwest, you end up in an alien world and you get this just totally wonky platforming and mm -hmm. there's like fantastic visual design, but the gameplay just didn't click. So, I mean, I, I've beaten it a bunch of times, you know, back in the day, mm -hmm. uh, but it Zen is just like 
loathed uh, by the fan community. So, so this fan effort, Black Mesa, has been just laboriously going through and remaking every single level and expanding it and bringing it up to, you know, a much more modern feel, uh, while trying to still, you know, keep the spirit of the original Half Life. Mm-hmm. And in order to realize you know, sort of the original vision of Zen, they have totally reimagined this final section of the game. Okay. Um, so my opinion on Black Mesa is, you know, it's great to go back to these areas that I've spent so much time in. Uh, but that style of gameplay, you know, is kind of, it, it's time is past. Uh, there is just so much time you spend going through corridors that are the same (laughs) and there's not quite enough variety of the enemies and it still feels okay. And I'm glad to have done it. Um, but the problem with Zen and Zen, okay, I got to say Zen is gorgeous. I mean, they have just done an utterly brilliant job of making that you're just making these colors pop, uh, making this look like an interesting alien world. Uh, but they've stretched it out over time and they've added puzzles and, and I think they've just stretched it out too long. Okay. And I actually played a, a, through Every, all of ha- uh, all of Black Mesa and like most of the Zen area. And I actually burned out on it because I'd mm-hmm. been like playing it over an entire week and I just couldn't do anymore because it was just feeling too the same to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, which is to say it is totally worth checking out. I mean, this okay. is just uh, an absolutely brilliant piece of remake. Um, it just doesn't quite have that modern game construction to it. Uh, so it's got the visuals, uh, the guns feel decent. Uh, and it's, it's just neat to see how well this works out. Uh, but, I just wish that they had taken sort of the modern um, uh, insights into tightening up the game as a whole and sort of collapsing some of the time fillers. I mean, back, you know, we're, th- we're talking back in the, be- be- in the days be- when people were, you know, on dial up to a certain extent. I mean, I think I mm-hmm. still had a, you know, a DSL line that had to dial up to connect. And uh, so you know, that your games were much more about you know, how much time you can spend to them. You know, a game being super long was great. So the fact that you are crawling through identical corridors, you know, was not that much of a, a problem, at least compared to what it's like now. And these days, it's like you just want a little more variety. Yeah. I hear that. Mm-hmm. I never played the original Half-Life, so that's why I was kind of interested in this, because I played through Half-Life 2 and its episodes, and I always wanted to be like, what's that original game like? And I, I was like, ah, yeah, I'll wait for Black Mesa to come out. And it finally did come out, and I'm like, ah, I'll give it a try now, maybe. It, so. Yeah, yeah, don't don't give the first one a shot. I mean, if you want to check out what Half-Life was, check this out, and I'd okay. say it's worth it. Okay, uh, sure. Yeah, I, I, Actually, if you do that, I will be super interested to hear your reaction. Okay, cool. So. It's only twenty yeah. bucks, so it was a, it was a pretty easy buy-in. So it was pretty yeah, amazing. exactly. And I mean, you know, I'd played, I played, mean, I spent plenty of hours with this game over its you know various points during its release. So I was more than happy to you know toss twenty bucks out to the devs for this. Yeah. Okay, cool. With that said, I guess let's get into topic. Uh, what are we talking about this week? Okay, this week's topic is runway de Warate, or smile down the runway, or as the on-screen title lists it. Smile at the Runway. And this is a manga adaptation, 12 episodes, about a boy who wants to become a fashion designer and a girl who wants to become a you know, Paris runway model, even though she is much too short for the position. There's, and, there's sort of... Hmm? Oh, and he is much too poor. <laughs> That's right. You you need money to bankroll, you know, materials and labor for fashion designing. And even though she is only five foot two, this girl just desperately wants to be a fashion model. And apparently what is what is the rule? You have to be like five ten or something to be a fashion model. Because um, they mentioned that there's a famous fashion model who is, quote unquote, short and she's five seven. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah, this is apparently a big problem because they fashion designers sort of 
need lots and lots of models, so they need uniformity among them, so they can all wear the same clothing sizes, I guess. I want to start by saying that I don't know anything about high fashion. I don't really care about anything about high fashion, but I did find this kind of intriguing. <laughs> this stuff, what I've watched, <laughs> like yeah. it taught me some things. I'm like, okay, <laughs> I can see this is kind of engaging. Uh, I didn't love it, but still, I watched I, the first five episodes and found myself reasonably entertained. But, I yeah. was surprised at how interested I was in this. Um, one of the things this uh, series does is that it has like multi episode arcs where our protagonists are introduced to a new situation another episode where they kind of overcome a challenge or two getting their footing and then a third episode where the big show happens and they have to really display their gut and gumption and and improve training um to overcome the challenge and move along um which actually is kind of surprising because normally you think of uh, a show about fashion as being a very shoujo kind of thing and in this one um it's it's treated much more as a shonen style kind of adventure quest even though the challenges are not necessarily beating people up or destroying them with energy beams it's still being confronted with a challenge and you know summoning your pluck and and gumption and and wisdom, I guess, and dealing with the uh, with the crisis. Which is interesting because this run, the manga this is based off, runs in Kandansha's Weekly Shonen Magazine, along with like Fire Force and Hajime no Ippo. Yeah. <laughs> so it, I was surprised to see that actually. I just found that out today <laughs> that that was the case. Uh, yeah. So the interesting thing is when this the series opens up, it first of all introduces you to Chiyuki Fujito, who is the aforementioned too short model wannabe. And she's, uh, she's very determined, but she's also a teenage girl and she's kind of stubborn and blunt and kind of sort of hinders her own efforts by being a little bit too blunt and, and abrasive sometimes, I think. And then there's, the guy who seems to get most of the attention, surprisingly, which is Ikuto Sumura, who is the poor kid who wants to become a fashion designer because he sort of makes clothing for his three sisters. And he he just has this emotional bond that, that making clothing for people, you know, makes them feel good and that makes you feel good. And... Uh, and that's that's kind of his initial motivation. And then uh, Chiyuki sort of like ropes him into designing for her because she she thinks he's got a good eye. I think they handle this in a very anime way. Now, I don't mean in the the typical formulaic bad kind of way, right? They, they weren't uh, running somewhere along a, a, a fine line of whether it was going to be one thing or another. They they took an idea, something that you normally wouldn't look at, wouldn't think about. Certainly guys wouldn't look at or <laughs> typically think about. Um, and, you know, they took something of of a unique kind of niche and made it into a show. And something worth watching, at least. Um, for me, though, I don't... This I'm not the demographic for this. This is certainly not my interest. Um, it's interesting to get a perspective on it, but it's certainly not my thing. Yeah, so um, this, you know, as has been said, definitely has that sort of, you know, shonen arc of, uh, you know, it's sort of the rags to riches approach or, you know, from, from you know, starting from zero and a lot of pluck and a lot of talent up to success. Uh, and I think they do a, a pretty good job with that. So uh, Chiyuki, uh, the, the female lead, you know, she, to a certain extent, is a child of privilege uh, because her father runs a modeling agency and she gets a lot of early success and then her growth stops and she is sidelined. And eventually her father, you know, says, basically, you know, if you don't cut this out, you're out. Mm -hmm. Um mm -hmm. 
but you know her pluck nonetheless you know keeps everybody on the uh, uh in the in milneige his modeling agency unwilling to just like you know completely cast her to the street so they just like keep throwing her just enough bones to to keep mm. her struggling along and you know ikuto is his problem is he's just a nice guy and he wants things to work for everyone and he wants to succeed without being a jerk about it and yeah. unfortunately yeah. as he discovers when he's um working in a fashion school's um end of the year you know cultural festival school fashion show every one of the other kids in the design class considers him their rival mm-hmm. he's just like uh, that's not nice. Well, there's the one character I saw in episode four who was the son of a famous fashion designer who actually, at least maybe this changes along as it goes, but he seems to want like, you know, he sees the potential in this guy. And he's like, I'm going to, at first he seems like a rival, but in reality, he wants him to be part of his brand. <laughs> so I mm-hmm. thought that was kind of an interesting twist on that, but maybe he doesn't go that direction. Yeah, no, it's true. And uh, but and, and again, it's, you know, do you subordinate subordinate your own artistic vision mm-hmm. for money is sort of like the the question yeah. that Ikuto has to keep confronting, you know, do, do you and does, you know, his need to be a nice guy interfere with the necessity to actually win in this cutthroat world? Mm. And cutthroat is right. Like <laughs> those first yeah. episodes, like wow, every aspect of high fashion sounds like it is brutal. <laughs> yeah. Just like, like whether you're a designer, a model, a writer, a journalist, writers about it, it just sounds like it's just a rough life. <laughs> you yeah. better be ready to, you know, I guess you know, slash throats to get your throat slashed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's uh, yeah, just like everybody in this is just so dire about how difficult it is to succeed and how you can be like ruined in an instant. Um, there's, there's one episode where, uh, Ikuto and the short model girl actually help out a designer at a fashion show because he had one of his models like, got sick or had a car accident or couldn't get to the show in time. So she, you know, steps up and volunteers to, to walk. And he's just like, Oh God, Oh God, Oh God, we're doomed a newbie. And she's too short and the dress won't fit her. So Ikuto steps up and he's like, okay, we've got a half an hour before the show starts. I'll modify the dress. So it, so it fits her and then he like freaks out because what are you going to do like 30 minutes before the show starts and uh just like every little detail is obsessed over and and you have to not only do something do it well but do the right thing and you've got everybody just sort of like laser focused on what you're doing and what your intention is and what the signifiers of it are. And uh, the ironic thing is that when she walks in the, uh, the fashion show, Chiyuki actually inspires somebody who is sort of like bummed out by the fashion industry because she also is short and she feels that fashion as sort of the high art industry has no consideration for anybody who isn't, you know, perfectly proportioned to be a fashion model, i.e. her. And she's just like, well, fashion is a dead end for me because I'm not tall enough to be a model. I don't have a model's perfect face and perfect figure. And when she sees Chiyuki going out there, she has the figure, she has the face, but she's short and well, normal sized, but short for fashion models. And this girl is all of a sudden inspired to say, oh, there is hope for people like me. There's somebody who's, quote, too short, but she's doing it and doing it well, and she's rocking it. And uh, she is inspired to to say, well, maybe it's it's worthwhile to 
to devote my my energy to doing fashion stuff. Yeah, I, I, this show does work uh, quite well in that shonen mold. So this is one of those shows that takes a topic broadly writ and says, we are going to make this topic the center of the universe. It is the most important thing. It is the most important thing for all the characters, but we don't actually care whether you, the reader or watcher actually know anything about this or care to a certain extent, (laughs) you know, we're going to, we're going to present everything you need. And by putting these characters who, where, you know, they have this unusual world, you know, that is the engagement you have, you know, you have Ikuto who is, you know, a genius fashion designer, but terribly, terribly inexperienced. Mm -hmm. And you have Chiyuki, who is a genius model, but, you know, terribly, terribly short. And so, you know, so you sort of have the, the, the dramatic conflicts that they're going to run up against again and again. And the show does a great job of sort of varying that up. Right. So it's not just, uh, you know, a mechanical thing. It's it, it's let's, you know, take these challenges and then we're going to put them in the context of, you know, the fashion industry. And we're going to draw on all this you know, different uh, flavor and color and sort of fantastic visual style to make this a show or you want to watch or a manga you want to read if you go back to the original. Mm -hmm. And I have to say that they have done a very good job with the visuals on this. Um, You know, it it definitely is uh, good as a fashion show, I would say. They they put a lot of care. What, what, What do you guys think about that? Um, I know nothing about fashion beyond looking at models in, in the mass media and going, oh, she looks good, or oh, she looks like a fashion model, which is kind of a turnoff for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm assuming that that all of the stuff they're they're talking about as far as being genius fashion inspiration is is classic stuff that people who understand fashion will probably go, oh my God, that's that's so 1970s or everybody knows about that. And they're they're sort of unveiling it as like this big, huge revelation in this anime. Um, but I don't care. So it's fine by me. <laughs> and, and, yeah. And, and, go, go ahead. I was say like, I, I'm sort of taking the word on it for a lot of these things. Like, okay, she's not, she's too short to be a traditional fashion model. Okay, I believe you. I don't really know what a th- ideal height is for a fashion model, but I'll, <laughs> I'll assume she's too short. Although I will say it's weird. She didn't grow a single centimeter after fourth grade. That's very strange. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like she should have grown a little bit. Maybe not tall enough, but they should have maybe let her say, but I only grew half the, my, the height I need to grow, not like nothing. I'm like, okay. <laughs> That's yeah. weird from a biology standpoint. <laughs> but... <laughs> Uh, And that actually is a good point, Uh, you know, for shows like this, you know, if you actually know too much about the topic, that might not actually be a plus, you know, you might actually start nitpicking. Uh, I also cannot comment on that, not being deeply versed in, you know, the fashion field. You're not? I thought you were. (laughs) (laughs) I am now. I have to disappoint you all. I I failed as a male model. (laughs) Oh, no. (laughs) And by failing, I mean I never tried. (laughs) So I know nothing. Uh, My sister for like a moment did some like teen modeling. Um, but, But even with that, that's like, you know, that's like catalogs and that's nothing like, you know, runways. So... Um, and I, uh, I am far from an expert by watching Project Runway because I've never watched Project Runway. So I don't know anything about modeling, but uh, I get a lot of the concepts based on, you know, this show. Um, I don't know. Uh, for me, this was not a bad anime. Um, I just don't think it's my sort of cup of tea. I, I, took, I took a few issues with some of it, though. I, so, for instance, the... Um... Hazime, the uh, I guess the the spin-off fashion designer from the uh, main character's father's company, mm. is where um the main care uh, Ikuto Ikuto uh, works is um so during their right before their big show um you know they bring in um the main character uh, Chiyuki 
to and they have to alter her dress to fit her because she's also very short so they have to make it so this dress actually works on her because one of the models called out and his employee who was supposed to do it like sort of gets a nosebleed and just like passes out and can't work anymore because (laughs) and also like they introduced this character as having like two hours of sleep probably after like i don't know 72 hours not of work i don't know (laughs) it was like (laughs) is my two hours of sleep really over already okay i'll get back to work and the main the designer like you know the main character you know ikuto runs up to visit you fix the dress i'll call an ambulance and the the desire just like doesn't give a shit he's just like oh my god i'm ruined this is awful (laughs) i'm just like no like f you like (laughs) your employee just like literally died of is dying of exhaustion (laughs) and you're just here (laughs) worrying about your own skin like that that just rubbed me the wrong way completely (laughs) and also there was another moment during that whole scene where like you know the the employee who right before she passed out she's like you know, getting the dress ready for Ch- uh, Chiyuki. And she says, like, oh, you have a model's body, something you can never have with two meals a day, <laughs> which is like, yeah. okay, that's also kind of messed up. <laughs> like, it's, it's just, I don't know. Like, as much as I found this a pretty fun show to watch as far as, like, you know, drama and tension was, I just, those things just, like, rub me the wrong way and maybe just, like, like there's something messed up with the, with the industry if that's how this is going. <laughs> but yeah, you're, you're not wrong there, yeah. I, I will tell you that. <laughs> So those are my issues, but still, I still find as a, as a shonen anime, I think they did a good job of making fashion uh, yes. shonen topic. I'll give them that for sure. <laughs> <laughs> but well, we, we we've seen like cooking shows that were very heavily shonen. Kind That's of true. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But there's like the 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 like I guess the abuse, not abuse, but like just the uh, I don't know what it is. It's just like it's just it's it's, it's just too much. Like it just feels un it just feels wrong in a lot of ways the way they sort of present some of these topics, but. They took a topic. I don't know. I mean, I'm looking too much into it, maybe. <laughs> but they took this topic and they turned it into a very anime sort of format. Well, I think I think I'm sorry. What Bryce is uh, getting at is that actually it's reflecting an extremely unpleasant reality, yeah. and you know, sort of the world of the show. You know, even if you immerse yourself in it, you know, it reminds you that actually this is a horrible, horrible business that is you know destroying people, uh, you know, psychologically and physically. Yeah. Yeah, like I'll well, say for like food wars and stuff, like these these like you know shonen cooking shows. I haven't watched a ton of them, but like it's it doesn't really present that in that way. Like it's sort of like it's all about like hey the cooking and fantastical ways of cooking in a shonen style. This mm. sort of t- I'm I guess like I'm glad it sort of dived into like a more like you know this is the dark side of this industry, yeah. but it doesn't really punish anybody for being the dark side of this industry. So I don't know. It's, That's very true. In the wrong way, yeah. Um, well, one of the weird things um, from an intellectual property standpoint is that apparently there is no such thing as like copywriting a design in the fashion world. You can rip off a design. You can't counterfeit it, but you can you know just appropriate the the sense of style that big fashion designers come up with. Um, and that's sort of the way the whole industry works. The like, very high culture people come out with um, like very extreme fashion statements um, for their periodic shows and then they have to like burn nitro to get enough of them produced and on shelves and sold before the people doing knockoffs figure out what the what the essential element of it is and then begin copying it like to a lesser degree more cheaply. So that's that's part of the reason why it's it's so cutthroat is because everything is is just this like hot house may fly life cycle of coming up with something creative and then exploiting it as quickly as you possibly can before somebody else exploits your idea for you. Okay. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I see what you're saying. Like, it's, you know, this is, it's a cutthroat industry for sure. I mean, maybe yeah. this show is maybe, <laughs> you know, exposing that in a way that maybe I didn't really realize before. Um, but, yeah, yeah, who knows? They're, <laughs> they're sort of alluding to the, to like the, the harsh aspects of it, but they're not really like wallowing right, yeah. in them. There's, there's more melodrama devoted to the fact that Ikuto's mom is in the hospital and, you know, she's dying of something that, doesn't look too you know 
facially disfiguring, but she's desperate to save money because the family is poor so that her children can achieve their dreams. Mm. And they're just like, no, mama, you have to have the operation with that money. And she's like, no, here, take the money, go and win the fashion show. And it's just like, that's, that's just very melodramatic. Uh, melodrama is, I'm afraid, a pretty good word for <laughs> a lot of the way that this show is approaching its material. And, you know, that's fine, but, mm. but mm-hmm. yeah, it should be acknowledged. Oh, yeah. It, it doesn't derail the show, but it's definitely part of, like, the whole anime world mindset of, of doing things. Is I've, I've never yet seen an anime that, that, that didn't indulge in a bit of melodrama and sentimentality when it saw an opportunity for it. <laughs> and in the world of shonen anime, I mean, look, I love shonen anime. There's a lot of melodrama in shonen anime. <laughs> like, it's not yeah. all just a bunch of people punching each other. Like, believe me, there's some melodrama behind those punches every time. <laughs> so this is a shonen series, so that's what you're that's what you're signing up for, and I'm totally cool with that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all right, well, I have three links for everybody. Uh, one goes to Funimation, one goes to the Wiki, one goes to Anime News Network. Um, oglink.com slash 4WY, 4WZ, and 4X0. And... Okay. Um, did everybody watch this subtitled? I understand that Funimation is, is doing a dub for this. No, I haven't watched it. Yeah, I watched the uh, subtitled version. I did watch the uh, full first season. Okay. Uh, I was okay with the way the first season wrapped up. Uh, it was a little obvious in the way they sort of had everybody come to their own individual endings. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, it was, you know, sort of a little too on the nose in terms of how they wanted the, the drama to develop. But um, as I understand it, another season has been greenlit. So, I would be happily watch more of this when it comes out. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd go along with that. This is not something that I really would have sat down and watched of my own inclination, but having seen it, I, I don't object. And while watching episodes for, for this podcast, I was sort of like looking forward to what happens in the next episode and how they're going to resolve this conflict and, you know, who's going to, step up and who's going to, you know, discover something. So it, it certainly yeah. wasn't painful. Cool. No, and yeah. I, I liked what I watched of it. I don't think I'm going to watch more. Right. But yeah. I, I definitely did not dislike because when I first heard the title, I was like, what? I don't want to watch an anime about fashion. Why is it just this? And that being okay. Yeah. Like I was like, it's pretty good. Actually, this, yeah. this does, this right. is a good job for the topic for sure. For me, that, at least. that's why <laughs> so. I keep sort of summarizing it. Is it does, it turns something, <laughs> in a very anime approach to make something you normally wouldn't look at and find a way to make it interesting, worthy enough to, to put it into a 24 minute format. Um, yeah. And a lot of sports shonen shows do that as well. When you think about it, I mean, like I don't like really care that much about sumo wrestling, but that sumo wrestling anime falls. Just, I actually enjoy my time with that as well. <laughs> like, you know, it's, yeah, yeah, it's, exactly. Yeah, it's, Make I'm, it dramatic, uh, melodrama for sure, but hey. Uh, I'm like, waiting okay, for the, uh, <laughs> the the anime about curling. <laughs> <laughs> that has to exist. If it doesn't, it will soon. <laughs> I'm sure it will. All right. Well, I'm going to close the show up because I don't think we have anything more to say. Yeah. Um, music was fine for it. Animation was perfectly fine for it. Um, it's not something I, it's something I'd recommend for people who are interested in this topic, but it certainly isn't something I'm interested in. Um, it wasn't bad to watch. It's just something I wouldn't watch more of personally. Um, anything else guys? I'm good. Nope. I think that's good. Okay. Nope. So, um, with that said, then let's, let's wrap the show up. Um, for the things we've mentioned, you can visit our website, www.talkgeneration.net or ognetworks.tv. Obviously, if you want the, the notes, uh, oglink.com slash og triple seven 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 seven. Um, let's see what else you want to hang out with us in Discord. Uh, you can do that, oglink.com slash Discord. You want to become a patron support, you can do that, oglink.com slash Patreon. Um, you can email us, you can tell us we were completely wrong and all the things, um, and you can do that at ataka.generation at gmail.com. We've had that 
email from the very beginning, so it's not like anyone can forget it. Um, okay, so I got a I got a fortune. All right, where do I? Let's see, let's see if we got a good one here. <laughs> okay, uh, this is what we got. Your dream must be bigger than your fear. Yeah, that's very on point with this series, actually. <laughs> yeah. There you go. <laughs> All right, got to take a picture of that one. All right, everyone, stay safe, stay home, and stay healthy. Until next week, have a good one. Bye.